Airborne forces were an invention of World War II. Great things were expected of this new way of waging war. Troops would be dropped from the skies behind enemy lines to seize key objectives, secure vital bridges and flanks, and disrupt the enemy's ability to respond. World War II demonstrated that airborne troops, confronted with regular troops, and especially tanks, lose hands down. This begs the question of how to level the playing field, how to back paratroops with armour. In short, can we make a tank fly? In the opening stage of the German attack on the west in May 1940, Fallschirmjäger attacked and seized the crucial Belgian frontier fortress of Eben im Eil, landing by DFS-230 glider, in part on the roof of the fort itself. The fall of Eben im Eil and the capture of bridges over the Albert Canal showed what airborne units could do in a short, aggressive action. It cleared the way for ground units to advance into Belgium. The other side of the coin was shown the following year during the German-Italian invasion of Crete in May 1941. Paratroop and glider-borne landings suffered massive casualties in the early phases of the operation, along with the loss of large numbers of transport aircraft. Airborne operations could succeed with surprise and against limited objectives, but if paratroops, lightly armed, came across regular formations with heavy weapons, they would come off worse every time. After Crete, Fallschirmjäger were never used in the airborne assault role again. This problem needs to be solved if airborne troops are to fulfil their potential. As things stand, they are lightly armed, they lack mobility, and they're difficult to resupply. They need to be provided with heavy equipment, anti-tank guns, transport, and especially tanks. Two things were needed. One was a tank that was light enough to be transportable by air. And the second, fairly obviously, was something that would actually transport it. Now, we're talking about World War II here, and there wasn't an aircraft capable of carrying a tank. But would it be possible to build a glider to do the job? The idea of a flying tank wasn't anything new. The engineer, J. Walter Christie, had come up with a design for a tank uh, which was self-powered with wings and a tail attached. And the Russian tank designer, Oleg Antonov, uh, had come up with a, a concept for a T-60 light tank. This had wings and a tail, but it was designed to be pulled into the air like a glider behind an aircraft. Neither of these designs worked. The Antonov A-40, well, basically the Soviet Air Force didn't have anything powerful enough to get it into the air. Troop-carrying gliders weren't anything particularly new either. Uh, the Luftwaffe had experimented a lot with gliders in the 1930s, uh, largely because they weren't allowed to build powered military aircraft. They used the DFS-230 10-man glider on Eben am Isle and also in the assault on Crete. The British, amongst others, had the 25-man airspeed Horsa and the US Army the slightly smaller CG-4A Waco, called by the British, who also used it, the Hadrian. Both a Horsa and a Waco could, at a pinch, carry a jeep or an anti-tank gun. But there's a bit of a difference between a two-ton jeep and a seven-ton tank. So what was needed was something different, a heavy cargo carrier. The company tasked with producing a glider was called General Aircraft Limited. Now, the first design they came up with was actually open-topped, the tank sitting in it, and the idea was the tank driver would actually fly the glider. That was not practical. Uh, so the design that was adopted was this one, which is the GAL-49 Hamel car. These things are very, very rare. Uh, there are no intact Hamel cars left anywhere. And this fuselage section is one of only three in existence. So that's a pretty rare survivor. The glider was built on a spruce and birch frame and clad with fabric covered plywood. Uh, there's a cabin for two pilots and quite remarkably, the plexiglass canopy has actually survived. And cargo is loaded through a large door at the front of the aircraft. 
The Hamel car was 21 metres long and it had a wingspan of 33 and a half metres. Now, that might seem quite long and it is about the same as a four engine Lancaster bomber. But compared to modern sport gliders, it's quite short. Now, the reason for this is that one of these very, very large gliders traveling at its approach speed of about 100 miles an hour is a very easy target for anti-aircraft fire. So having shorter wings and big flaps meant that a steep diving approach was possible, leveling out before landing. So, as you can see, with the Tetrarch light tank in place, and we'll come to that in just a moment, there's actually very little space inside the glider. So the tank crew would travel inside the tank itself. Now, when the glider was preparing to descend, the tank driver would start the engine, and he then got two cable releases, one of which releases the shackles that's actually holding the tank in place, and the second of which opens the nose door, the cargo door. Of course, if that failed, he could just drive straight through it. The glider had a tailwheel undercarriage with the front wheels mounted on underwing struts with hydropneumatic suspension. For loading, this would be depressurised and that would bring the deck of the glider down low enough for the tank to reverse aboard. On landing, the pilot, and he's up there somewhere, was supposed to jump down and depressurise the undercarriage. Of course, if that didn't happen, the tank could just crash its way out. 344 Hamel cars were built between 1943 and 1946. The towing aircraft was usually a Halifax or a Stirling bomber. The principal base for British glider-borne operations being RAF Tarrant Rushton, here in Dorset. It is, let's face it, very crude. Um, I mean, certainly compared to modern aircraft. But we do now have a glider capable of carrying and delivering a light tank. The question now is finding a tank which is light enough for air transport. The British Army actually had an existing design, the A-17 Tetrarch, properly called the Light Tank Mark VII. Light tanks had been part of the Army's inventory in the interwar period, but they performed badly in France in 1940. Poor armour protection, poor armament, and the concept was on its way out. The Tetrarch did, however, fit the bill for air mobility. It weighs a little over seven tonnes and, for the time, which was 1941, it had a reasonable gun, the two-pounder. This was used on most early war British tanks. It also had 16 mm riveted armour, which again, wasn't bad for the time. Our example here has a three-inch howitzer instead of the two-pounder, which made a better weapon for close support of infantry, certainly better than the two-pounder, which didn't fire HE, only AP. It's also got another unusual feature. It steers by warping its tracks. The way this works is that each of the big road wheels is mounted on a hydropneumatic strut. And when the driver turns the steering wheel, these cause the track to bend and the vehicle to turn. Tetrarch wasn't found suitable for use in the Western desert because it suffered from overheating problems. Uh, a few were used in the invasion of Madagascar, but it didn't really have a viable role until, basically because it weighed about right, it was chosen for Operation Tonga, the airborne element of the invasion of Normandy. So far, so good, but this was a 1941 tank about to deploy onto a 1944 battlefield. On the 6th of June, 1944, 20 Hamel cars carrying the Tetrarchs, the British 6th Airborne Armoured Reconnaissance Regiment, took off from Tarrant Rushton for Normandy. One Tetrarch broke loose inside its glider and caused it to crash in mid-channel. Two other gliders collided on landing and another Tetrarch, having extracted itself from its glider, was hit by another glider coming into land. Eleven Tetrarchs became hopelessly fouled with parachute shrouds wrapped around their tracks. The time it took to free them did at least mean they were spared an encounter with the Panzer Fours of Kampfgruppe von Luck, and that would have ended very badly for them, I think. Two Tetrarchs did move off, one was destroyed by a Stug, and the last one hit an anti-tank mine. 
probably the best result of the deployment of the Tetrarchs was actually quite accidental. 21st Panzer Division, which is the only German armoured unit capable of intervening in the Normandy invasion, hearing that tanks were being landed in their rear, chose not to press home their attack on the British beaches. For the rest of the time, the Tetrarchs were used for reconnaissance and then relegated to an HQ role. Six AARR was finally withdrawn from Normandy in September. Now, the Tetrarchs, being very few in number and basically obsolete, didn't play a significant part in the campaign. Certainly not enough to justify the time and effort spent getting them there. Bearing this in mind, it must have been the triumph of hope over experience that made the British Army try again, this time as part of Operation Varsity, the Rhine crossings. The glider was the same, the Hamel car, and that had also been used at Arnhem to transport anti-tank guns, jeeps, other equipment, but not on that occasion tanks. But the tank chosen was different. This one, the M22. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. The Locust, to give it its British name, is very similar in a number of ways to the Tetrarch. It's got a three man crew, weighs 7.4 tonnes, and it's got a fairly good top speed of 64 kilometres an hour. The M6 37mm gun was, if anything, not quite as effective as the British two-pounder. In fact, the high explosive round that was produced for it uh, was so ineffective that in firing on the range, uh, an observer actually had to ask where the round had landed because they couldn't actually see the detonation. The M22 was designed to be air portable, but having said that, the US Army didn't actually possess a glider that could carry it. So the idea was it would be slung underneath a Douglas C-54 Skymaster with the turret removed. And that's what these lugs are for. The only thing is you can't consider that to be tactical deployment because to start off with, the Skymaster would need um, an airstrip to land on. And secondly, putting the turret back on is not exactly a quick job. You're not gonna be doing that in combat. The M22 was built at the behest of the British Army, and in fact, it never saw combat service with the US Army at all. Of the 830 that were built, 230 were sent to Britain under terms of the Lend-Lease Agreement. And of those, eight would finally see combat use with the long-suffering 6th AARR, who got them in replacement for their Tetrarchs. As part of Operation Varsity, March 1945 Rhine crossings, these took part in the assault, again in Hamilcar gliders. One M22 shifted in flight and crashed through the tail of the glider, causing it to crash, and another glider hit a ditch on landing, with the tank finishing upside down. Of the six remaining, one was knocked out by an assault gun, and two others advancing up a ridge to provide fire support for US paras of the 17th Airborne Division attracted so much hostile artillery fire, it actually caused casualties amongst the paratroops. The remainder provided fire support, but to be honest, the 37 mm gun's HE round was so ineffective, it was probably of limited use. Op Tonga and Op Varsity were the only two times that tanks were air-landed during World War II, and both occasions, very limited success. The Hamilcar gliders worked well enough, but to be honest, neither the Locust nor the Tetrarch were really worth it. If the Hamilcars had been used as they were at Arnhem for the transport of heavy weapons and stores, that might have been a better use of resources. But in all honesty, the transport of light tanks really wasn't worth the effort. The game wasn't worth the candle. The use of gliders continued post-war into the late 40s, but to be honest, they'd really had their day. The advent of bigger and more powerful transport aircraft and helicopters made gliders redundant. Uh, and the face of warfare was changing, as were the challenges of deploying tanks at speed and at distance. The armour used during the Korean War was deployed by sea and land transport in the conventional way. 
But the French are about to experiment with the airlifting of tanks in their fight against the Viet Minh in Indochina, the country which is now known as Vietnam. To disrupt Viet Minh supply lines, it was decided to construct a large base in the Dien Bien Phu Valley. Um, this is going to be supplied by air via an airstrip the Japanese built during World War II. So to this extent, uh, 10,800 men supported by artillery and 10 M24 Chaffee light tanks were air freighted into Dien Bien Phu. The Chaffee uh, entered service in November 1944, and it was well liked by its crews. It replaced the obsolete Stuart light tank, and what it lacked in armour protection, it made up for in mobility and the excellent 75mm M6 gun. At 17.8 tonnes, the Chaffee was too large and much too heavy for the transport aircraft available. So each tank was broken down into 180 component parts for shipping and then reassembled on arrival. The Chaffees gave a good account of themselves. Uh, providing fire support, the 10 tanks fired 15,000 rounds during the course of the two month siege. And they were instrumental in repelling a number of Viet Minh attacks. Despite this, Dien Bien Phu was a catastrophic failure for the French. But it's probably the first time that air-deployed tanks actually earned their keep in combat. In the decades after World War II, aircraft technology, and specifically the helicopter, made a huge difference to the battlefield and also the need for armour in support of airborne operations. In Vietnam, a new concept, air cavalry, was employed for the first time in place of paratroops, a ground force that could be transported and supplied by helicopter. Welcome to the new cavalry. We will ride into battle, and this will be our horse. At Yadrang in November 1965, in a scenario that could have been a replay of Dien Bien Phu, Two battalions of the US 1st Cavalry Division, Air Mobile, held a position against considerable odds with the aid of air and long-range artillery support. As depicted in the film, we were soldiers. Was there even a future for paratroop operations, let alone the armour needed to support them? At the same time as these questions were being asked, aircraft like the C-130 capable of carrying a light tank and either airdropping or landing on a primitive airstrip, had entered service along with helicopters like the CH-47 Chinook, carrying light AFVs as an underslung load. Tanks of this period, designed with air mobility in mind, include the US Army's M551 Sheridan and the British CBRT range. Air mobility removes the need for aircraft to land, meaning potentially less exposure to hostile fire. The M551 Sheridan, termed an AR-AAV, Armoured Reconnaissance or Airborne Assault Vehicle, weighs just over 15 tonnes. It has an aluminium hull with a steel turret. Main armament was a 152mm gun launcher with 20 caseless rounds and nine shillelagh missiles. Of the 1,662 Sheridans built, around 200 served in Vietnam. Vulnerability to mines and RPGs aside, the Sheridan proved useful in the direct fire support role. In November 1989, 14 Sheridans were shipped to Howard Air Force Base in the Panama Canal Zone prior to the US invasion of Panama. Of these, 10 were delivered via C-141 low-velocity airdrop to Torrijos Tokimen Airport. One was destroyed and another damaged when their parachutes failed to open but the rest were used to secure high-value targets in Panama City. The deterrent effect of tanks was reported to be highly effective on this occasion, and this remains the only combat airdrop of tanks by parachute in history. The British CVRT range combat vehicle reconnaissance tract, like this scimitar, was specifically designed with air portability in mind, and above all, the ability to be airdropped. It weighs in at just under eight tons, 7.8 tons. It can punch above its weight with 30 millimeter Raden cannon. 
And these gave very good service in Afghanistan, Iraq, and also in the Falkland Islands. In the Falkland Islands campaign of 1982, although the scimitars of the Blues and Rawls were transported by sea, when the boot was on the other foot, the vehicle's air portability was demonstrated when a mine-damaged scimitar was recovered slung under a Chinook. The ability of tanks, especially main battle tanks, to dominate an area can't be overestimated. An MBT is superb at persuading the opposition that it really isn't a good idea to pick a fight. The main problem is that weighing over 60 tonnes, a main battle tank is a difficult proposition to transport by air. The British Army in Helmand was not able to deploy its Challenger MBTs because, quite simply, we hadn't got the airlift capability to get them there. We ended up having to rely on the Danish Army. They'd got five Leopard 2s, uh, which had been commercially air freighted in. This wouldn't be a problem now, as the RAF has invested in a fleet of C-17 Globemaster aircraft. Now, these have a lift capability of up to 69 tonnes, so they would be able to handle either a Challenger 2 or an M1A2 Abrams. The only thing is, you can't consider this to be a tactical airlift, because for a start off, the C-17 needs a major airport runway to land on. And the other thing is, you'd need to strip any extra armour packages uh, off the tanks, like the British Army's Tez or the US Army's Tusk. If you don't do that, the tank is A, too big and B, too heavy for the aircraft. So, in conclusion, whatever the technology involved, moving tanks by air is always going to be extremely difficult. And there has to be a major need to want to do it. The idea of making armour air portable has gone from the use of towed gliders to heavy lift transport aircraft and helicopters, and from ineffective light tanks to a range of lightweight AFVs. Long range heavy lift transport aircraft are now able to deliver MBT weight vehicles into theatre. Not a tactical airlift, but they're able to get the vehicles to where they're needed, into distant and inaccessible theatres of operations. From World War II, where the need was to support paratroops, but frankly, neither the gliders nor the tanks were actually up to the job, to Indochina, where the approach was to strip down tanks, air freight them, and then reassemble them. That was very lengthy and frankly, not tactical in any way. In more recent times, a lot of development, effort and training has been expended on developing aircraft, technology and suitable vehicles for the job. But this has seldom been put into real-time practice. This has been a very short and really rather incomplete survey. I uh, haven't talked about vehicles like the West German Wiesel, the range of wheel platforms that are available, um, let alone things like the huge uh, airdrop exercises carried out by the former Soviet army. But the fact remains that the number of times that airdrop armour has actually been used on the battlefield remains vanishingly small. Making a truly effective tank fly, and just as importantly, landing it intact, is very difficult indeed. Thanks for watching. Really hope you've enjoyed this film. If you did, please like, subscribe, and if you can, support us on Patreon.